Police Department. Everybody go back in your house, get off the street. This is the San Diego Police Department. Everybody get off the street and go back into your house right now. Ah. That's not good. Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains on a rampage. And today, we are going to discuss an actual rampage that actually happened in San Diego, California, involving an actual tank. Yeah, this is a thing that occurred, maybe before some of you were born. But uh, not before I was born, I remember when this happened. Uh, so I can speak from, uh, well, I wasn't there, but I remember when it happened. So that, that's something. This is the story of the 1995 San Diego tank rampage. Our story centers around a man by the name of Sean Timothy Nelson. He was born August 21st, 1959 in Bird's Eye, Utah, but he grew up in the Claremont neighborhood of San Diego, California, and graduated from Madison High School. Following that, he enlisted in the United States Army, where he served for two years, until an honorable discharge in 1980. During that time, he would learn to drive a tank. This is going to be relevant later. Once he was discharged, he returned to San Diego and worked as a plumber. And for a while, it seemed like things were going all right for him. Plumbing is very lucrative. You make a lot of money if you're a good plumber. And it seemed like Sean was doing all right. He got married, was making decent money, had a place to live. But then, in 1988, his mother died, which seemed to hit Sean pretty hard. Two years after that, his wife filed for divorce in 1990. And then in 1992, his father also passed away. During this time, Sean would take a serious turn for the worse mentally. He began to rely on drugs and alcohol. In terms of the drugs, it was specifically methamphetamine. Now, if you don't live in America, maybe you're not super familiar with meth, but I once knew someone who was a recovering addict. So I can quote the words of an actual addict for you here. Don't do meth. Meth is a very, very addictive substance, and I assure you it will not solve your problems at all. It may feel good at first, but the problem with meth is that it ravages the human body rather quickly. The individual I knew who was on this stuff would suffer mild tremors, even though she was only on it for a few months. Sean was doing this for years, and combined with alcohol, it was doing his already questionable mental health no favors. Also in 1992, he was hospitalized at the Sharp Memorial Hospital, who he partially blamed for his mother's death, I should mention. He had suffered neck and back injuries in a motorcycle accident, but he wound up suing the hospital for $1.6 million for negligence, assault, battery, and false imprisonment, as Sean felt they had treated him without his consent. Maybe that was true, but if he had neck and back injuries, Sean, I, I know, I know you're struggling, man, but... You cannot just walk off neck and back injuries, my dude. It, it doesn't work that way. The court wound up dismissing Sean's case, and the hospital countersued for $6,640 in medical fees and legal expenses they had suffered. Sean's brother Scott provided some insight regarding his, um, well, particular issues. His instability was starting to show. Outside of the meth addiction, he had a habit of yelling at his roommate during the night, and he exhibited unusual behavior. For example, he dug a 15 foot deep hole in his backyard, which he said was an attempt to mine for gold. One of his friends mentioned that it was his new hobby, which, okay, I mean, if it's helping you get outside and dig, you know, some physical activity, I guess, but I, I just feel like you're not gonna find any gold in your backyard. It, the chances of that happening are very unlikely. Bad luck also continued to follow Sean around. In June of 1994, his plumbing equipment was stolen from his truck. This is a problem because that was his entire income. That was his job. It's what he did. And as a result, he had no income. His utilities were cut off, and his house went into foreclosure. 
He had a live-in girlfriend, and in April of 1995, she left him as well, leaving him alone in a house with only the meth and alcohol to comfort him. That's when the questionable stability of Sean began to really creep up on him. A week prior to the tank thing, Nelson apparently told a friend that he was thinking of committing suicide, and that following weekend, he told another friend that Oklahoma was good stuff. That statement was referring to the Oklahoma City bombing, which had happened just a month before. It remains the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in U.S. history. It was perpetrated by anti-government extremists Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. Now, it was never exactly cleared what Sean meant by good stuff. Whether he condoned the attack, or if he just enjoyed the whole news drama surrounding it. But either way, I would consider, personally, that someone calling any kind of terrorist attack good stuff to be a little bit of a red flag. But police also confirmed that Sean didn't appear to have any connections with any kind of terrorist group. So, he clearly acted on his own in this case. Speaking of acting on his own, let's get to the actual tank rampage. At 6.30pm on Wednesday, May 17th, 1995, Sean drove his Chevy van to the California Army National Guard Armory on Mesa College Boulevard in the Kearney Mesa neighborhood of San Diego. The employees there had been working late that day, and at the time, the gate to the vehicle yard was left open, and nobody was there to watch it. Due to the fact that these are tanks required for use in the battlefield, they didn't actually have keys that you needed to start them. And if you think about that, it actually kind of makes sense. Can you imagine the awkward discussion two soldiers would have when one realized the other forgot the keys to their tank while they're under attack by an enemy? I mean, that's not something you want to deal with, so of course they only started with a push button. But uh, that's why Sean was able to start this one so easily. Though admittedly, the first two he broke into wouldn't actually start at all. It was only when he got into the third tank that he was able to turn it on. The tank was an M60A3 Patton. The Patton tanks are second generation main battle tanks of the American Armed Forces. They were developed from the M48 Patton, but the M60 was actually never officially christened as a Patton tank. The Army only considered it a product improved descendant of the Patton. Either way, the M60s were really good tanks in their day. They first entered service in 1959. The A3 was an improved model, produced between 1978 and 1983. Over 15,000 over all the variants of these tanks were produced. And it's probably worth mentioning that since this was an A3, this thing weighed about 50 tons and had armor that was 10.87 inches thick. That's 276 millimeters, nearly a foot of armor. So when Sean got into it and started it up, it was a hard job to get this thing to stop. The guard did notice as soon as he got in to the tank, but there wasn't much he could do once Sean took off with it. Though, fortunately, the National Guard stored ammunition for these tanks separately from the actual tanks, so it wasn't loaded, but it's a tank. I mean, this is still not a good situation. The guard called the police, and Nelson led them on a 23-minute televised chase through the streets of Claremont. If you're around my age, you probably watched this on TV as it happened, or perhaps on World's Wildest Police Videos. Remember that show? And I also remember that show? Oh, my dad and I used to watch that show all the time, and I swear every other episode had this chase because, well, to be fair, in terms of Wildest Police Videos, I don't think it gets crazier than this. The police are chasing a literal war machine here. And what are they going to do? That was kind of their issue. Recently, demilitarizing the police has been a hot button issue politically. But I'm going to be real with you. The police don't have anything that can deal with an M60, okay? There's nothing in their arsenal. Nothing that has a remote chance of stopping this thing. It's a 50-ton, heavily armored behemoth of war. San Diego PD Crown Victorias are not going to do anything about this. Try a pit maneuver on it. Go on, try it. I dare you. Now, the chase was never very fast because the M60A3 was only capable of about 30 miles per hour. But 
that was a little irrelevant because that really wasn't the problem. Speed had nothing to do with the issues surrounding the situation. Most of what the police were trying to do was, A, get civilians out of the friggin' way because, yo, and B, try to figure out what they were even gonna do about this. All they could really do was follow him. They couldn't stop the tank. Even the more heavily equipped SWAT teams had nothing that could deal with this. It's not like police departments are issued RPGs. So they followed him and Sean plowed through everything in his path. Though fortunately, he never did manage to kill anybody. And whether or not he was even trying to is still kind of debated on. For most of it, he doesn't seem to go out of his way to murder anybody. But most of what he does could have easily done that. So he may just not care who gets in his way. It's been speculated that he may have actually been heading for Sharp Memorial Hospital, who, like I said, he unsuccessfully sued and partially blamed for his mother's death. But that theory has never been proven. Either way, this was not a good situation. And at one point, they were seriously considering asking the Marine Corps to send an AH-1 Cobra attack helicopter to blow up the tank. Some have called that an extreme reaction. I disagree. This isn't some punk kid who stole your mom's four-door sedan for a joyride, okay? This is a man with a meth-addled, mentally unstable brain who stole an armored war machine. A literal tank that can run over anything in its path. It is designed to do that exact thing, in fact. And the longer it goes on, the more likely it is that the thing that winds up in his path is a person. So you know what? I'll be real with you. Yes, send out the Cobra. Blow it up. Do anything to stop this madness. In fact, the only reason this chase didn't become deadly was due to sheer unspeakable luck. Some might even call it divine intervention. After failing to destroy a bridge, possibly to block police from pursuing him, he wound up on State Route 163, which is a freeway. At first, he was staying on the right side of the road, but then he attempted to cross into opposing traffic. This would have been absolutely horrific. There's no telling how many people he would have been able to kill, depending on exactly where he was planning to go or what he was planning to do. But whichever construction workers actually poured the concrete and set up that center divider, I hope they got a raise. Because Sean managed to get the tank stuck on it. He couldn't move. He wiggled it back and forth, but eventually this caused one of the tracks to come off. He wasn't going anywhere, though he was still trying. Police immediately seized what could be their last chance to actually stop the madness. San Diego police officer Paul Paxton, who was a gunnery sergeant at the time with the Marine Corps Reserve, managed to get the hatch open with bolt cutters. The police ordered Nelson to surrender. He looked up at them, but then just looked back and continued trying to move the tank. Then, Paxton's partner, Officer Richard Piner, aimed and shot Nelson in the neck. He was taken, ironically, to Sharp Memorial Hospital, where he died of his injury. He would, amazingly, be the only one who was killed during the incident. The state of California wound up paying $149,201 to cover property damage done by Nelson during the attack. Some people have questioned the police using lethal force in this situation, but as they put it, they were worried that if he got the tank free, even with its lost tread, it might still be able to hit oncoming traffic. Nelson wasn't surrendering, and he was in control of a deadly war machine. And even Sean's brother, Scott, believed that the police were justified in shooting him. But the group that fell under pretty heavy scrutiny over the incident was the National Guard Armory, where Nelson stole the tank. Because, frankly, it feels like that shouldn't be something that was that easy to do. In addition to the open and unguarded gate, the fence surrounding that lot had a bunch of barbed wire that was damaged. Residents near the armory said that even if the gate had been locked, Nelson could have just climbed over the fence. The army officials defended themselves, saying that such an action just wasn't foreseen since only someone with proper knowledge could operate or even start a tank. Nelson just happened to be a veteran who did have this knowledge. After this incident, security was massively improved, 
at the Kearney Mesa Armory. And as for Sean Nelson's legacy, well, I'm not completely without empathy for him. I mean, he did lose most of his family and fell victim to drugs and alcohol. Even his brother is quoted as saying that the person who committed the acts on that day in 1995 wasn't the Sean that everybody knew. Sean Nelson, in his prime, when he was happy, would never have even consider doing such a horrible thing. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoff 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Bride Dagger 8, Twin Fox, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, and Major Klutz. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual Lafon, farewell. <laughs>